We are entering into a period of time with lots of very large fluctuations in food prices, both in the global market, in the world market, and at the national level in various developing countries. That's because of the um, extreme weather events that are closely associated with climate change. Um, along with that comes, of course, reductions or fluctuations in, in production, which will be translated into fluctuations in food prices. And when these things begin to happen, governments take action sometimes to make the matters worse. When, if prices are on their way up because of production shortfalls in certain areas due to climate change, Governments may push the prices up further by doing uh, certain things like um, procuring food from the market. Speculators get into the picture saying, oh, I have money to invest in food in the futures market because it looks like food prices are going to continue to go up. So let me jump in. That would push the prices up further. So there's a group, uh, there's a bunch of things that together will push up food prices until such time that everybody agrees that uh, it's too high and then they will come back down at a very rapid rate. You got these price fluctuations now that are much worse than they used to be in the past. That started in 2007. In the middle of 2007, we saw the first price spike. Rice prices tripled in a matter of seven to eight months. Wheat and corn prices or wheat and maize prices uh, increased at a very rapid rate as well until the middle of 2008, at which point they all came down very, very quickly. We needed to understand not only how governments would react to these kinds of new price volatilities, but also why they would react the way they did. How did governments respond? And why? What are the interest groups or the lobby groups that will influence the um, uh, policy process in such a way that you end up with uh, a set of policies? Uh, what is the power of the government vis-a-vis -vis certain lobby groups and so on? So we're looking at this whole complex set of issues in order to better understand the policy process and how that uh, process is influenced. If we understand how governments respond, or rather how governments responded in the past, we can begin to predict how they would respond this time, and we can help governments respond differently to achieve the goals that they set for themselves. Well, first of all, I think if we really want to understand uh, how policies are put in place, how they are designed and how they implement it. You have to do case studies. If you don't do case studies, you end up with um, more superficial information, uh, knowledge that doesn't really get to the bottom of the problem. So by doing a set of, of case studies, you're much more, and then you, you can then synthesize the results across the case studies you are more likely to come up with something that's useful for predicting uh, and advice, predicting future policies and advising governments. We uh, started out with identifying 18 developing countries, as well as the uh, European Union and the United States. And we wanted, and, and those 18 developing countries were picked to get diversity. We wanted uh, traditional exporters, uh, food exporters, traditional food importers, uh, self-sufficient countries, landlocked countries. We wanted countries from Africa, Asia, and Latin America. So ha we, had a, a, we wanted diversity in the selection of cases. We then, um, we then grouped the countries according to um, uh, their characteristics, and then picked countries from each of those groups. Now comes the difficult one. How do you find the researchers in those countries who, can, who are willing to work with us and who can do this kind of research? Because we didn't want to sit in Helsinki or Ithaca, New York, 
or anywhere else to do the study on these countries. The studies had to be done in the countries themselves by people uh, in those countries. And, and selecting those people was more an art than a science. Uh, we didn't have a randomized uh, experimental design. We couldn't quite figure out how to make that work. So instead, we looked at our networks, the wider network, the Cornell University network. We got uh, names from uh, the International Food Policy Research Institute in Washington, D.C. They, of course, have networks. And we simply put together a group uh, of, of people that we thought would be ideal for this study. We approached those people. Most of them said yes. A few said no. Uh, we had the first workshop where we brought everybody together. And after that first workshop, which was used to set the agenda for the study, uh, if you like the content of the study, we agreed on the methodology. But after that, we lost four of the 18 developing countries. Uh, the four uh, left us for whatever reason. So we, we ended up with 14 developing countries and the EU and the US, and of course they stuck with us. So if your question is, how do you select such a, an outstanding network of researchers, or how do you select a network of such outstanding researchers? Um, it takes prior knowledge. You have to work with the networks that you have, and you just hope that you haven't overlooked uh, people that really should be in there. We ended up with an outstanding uh, group of people. They all did excellent research. We worked together. We had three workshops during, during this um, two and a half year, uh, years of study. Uh, and we worked very, very closely together throughout. We all learned a lot. This was not a training exercise, but, but we all learned whether you're from a developing country or you're from a developed, so-called developed country, we all learned from this kind of teamwork. We know a lot more now about um, why governments respond to food price volatility the way they do. We also learned quite a bit about how they responded but that information you could get from other sources. The information we got about why they responded the way we did is really not available from any other source. It is tricky to get this information because there's a lot of sensitivity involved. Is one interest group um, more influential than another interest group? What about the various ministries in the government? Do they work together or do they have um, competing uh, goals, and do they, in fact, in, in some way, uh, introduce conflicts into the government? Those things are very sensitive, and they can only be um, uh, researched by people who are close to the government and to these um, uh, lobby groups. Uh, they can't be, uh, well, you can't get this information if you fly in from uh, Helsinki or Ithaca or Washington. You have to be on the ground. What we did to help the researchers in the various countries get access to this kind of data was we had a component in the project that would um, make it possible to have either a current or more appropriately a former policy maker or politician, if you want to use that term, who understood how the system worked and who had access to the policymakers of today. And by working together, the researcher in the country and this former policymaker, they could actually get access to information that we would otherwise not be able to get. Now, there were limits to that. We wanted to understand to what extent corruption was involved in policymaking. And we had to let that one go because the people we work with in those countries would like to stay in their countries and they would not necessarily want to go to jail for doing research. So we didn't get very far on the corruption. So we, we know from anecdotal evidence uh, that there was corruption going on, but we don't have any structured uh, research to, uh, to document that. I don't think that's a major uh, fault in the project. It's just a reality you can't 
ask a researcher in a country um, to expose um, a minister uh, who may be corrupt. It was an opportunity to use a natural experiment to generate the kind of knowledge that we badly need. We don't know whether such an opportunity comes about again. Unfortunately, it probably will. We will have another price spike. We don't know when it's going to happen. So this was an opportunity to actually generate the knowledge that would be useful for future decision making. The, it's the information that was, that was collected beginning in 07, um, now outdated? No. Unfortunately, it's not. I wish it were. I wish the world had moved ahead and everybody was more enlightened now, but I'm afraid that's not the case. So, no, that kind of research isn't outdated after a few years. Uh, if we have another price spike, um, Hopefully somebody will do another set of studies and we need to continue to update this. But no, this book uh, is uh, going to be um, timely for uh, quite some time to come. It is very much a hallmark of WIDA. That is uh, the way WIDA operates. And of course, as part of these network uh, efforts, these team efforts, you are learning from each other. Now, this is very different from bringing somebody into a university and giving them a degree. This is learning by doing. And the people that WIDA works with, in most cases, uh, are already at a level where they have learned the basics, but by working together, you can learn from each other. And it doesn't matter what kind of degree or what kind of experience you have, you can always learn more from uh, working in teams. So yes, I think that is the hallmark mark of uh, WIDA, and I think it's a hallmark that should be maintained. Well, WIDA is doing extremely well. It has produced a tremendous amount of good knowledge. It has contributed to a very large extent to training of people, uh, both in developing countries and, well, training uh, everybody who has been involved in that. WIDA's approach to create networks and have team efforts, I think, is the approach that needs to be continued. I'm impressed to see the tremendous growth in WIDA both in terms of quantity and quality under the current director uh, during the last few years. And I would like that trend to continue. I think wider can become larger, uh, but not too large, because uh, it has tremendous benefits from being a small and well-organized and well-led organization. And sometimes when organizations grow too fast, uh, they lose some of these uh, good characteristics. So my um, advice to WIDA, keep it up. Um, you can, you can um, grow a bit more and keep up the quality that you have shown that you can generate. Uh, I don't think you need to make major changes. Mm -hmm.